Hello. If a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? An age-old philosophical question, you might think. But in fact, this question was given a decisive answer in the 17th century by the father of modern science, Galileo. And that's what I'd like to start talking to you about today. So a key moment in the scientific revolution was Galileo's declaration that mathematics was to be the language of the new science, that the new science was to have a purely quantitative vocabulary. This is a much discussed moment. What is perhaps less discussed is the philosophical work that Galileo had to do to get to that position. And that's because before Galileo, following Aristotle, people thought that the, the physical world was filled with qualities. There were colors on the surfaces of objects, smells floating through the air, tastes actually inside food. Uh, and the problem is you can't capture these kinds of qualities in the purely abstract quantitative vocabulary of mathematics. You can't capture in an equation what it's the redness of a red experience or the spiciness of paprika. So this was a challenge for Galileo's aspiration to exhaustively describe the physical world with mathematics. So what did he do? Well, Galileo got around this by proposing a radically new philosophical theory of reality. So we think of Galileo as a great experimental scientist, which of course he was, but he was also a great philosopher. So he proposed this theory, and according to this new philosophical theory, the qualities aren't really out there in the physical world, rather they are in the consciousness of the observer. So if there's someone looking at a tomato, uh, the, the redness isn't really out there on the surface of the tomato, rather it's in the consciousness of the person observing it. Or if someone's eating paprika, the spiciness isn't really inside the paprika, it's rather in the consciousness of the person eating the paprika. Or to return to the example we started with, if there's a huge tree crashing down in a forest, but there's no one there to hear it, no observer, no consciousness, no sound. So Galileo, as it were, stripped the physical world of its qualities. And after he'd done that, all that remained were the purely quantitative features of matter, things that can be captured in mathematical geometry, things like size, shape, location, motion, properties we can model in mathematics. Um, so so in, in Galileo's world view, there's this radical division in nature between two domains. On the one hand, the domain of the purely quantitative domain of science on the one hand, and the qualitative domain of consciousness on the other. So on the one hand, the, the, the domain of science with its purely quantitative properties of size, shape, location, motion. And on the other hand, the domain of consciousness, consciousness with its qualities of colors, sounds, smells, and tastes. So this is the start of mathematical physics, which has gone incredibly well. But what we've forgotten, I think, is that it was never intended that physics should be a complete description of reality. The whole project was premised on putting consciousness outside of the domain of science. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, I think this has crucial implications for the area I work in, namely the science and philosophy of consciousness. I want to start by clearing up a little bit of ambiguity. The word consciousness is, is, is a very ambiguous word. Often people use it to mean something quite sophisticated like self-consciousness, awareness of one's own existence. This is something quite sophisticated that we might be reluctant to ascribe to many non-human animals. It's not clear a, a rabbit is aware of its own existence. But all, all that I'm going to mean, you know, all that's generally meant in these discussions by the word consciousness, it's probably a little bit, bit of a misleading word, really. All it really means is experience. Pleasure, pain, visual or auditory experience, these are all forms of consciousness. So consciousness in this sense is certainly something where we'd be happy to ascribe quite generally in the animal kingdom. Whether or not a rabbit is aware of its own existence, it certainly has experiences. If you're cruel enough to put a knife in a rabbit, it's going to feel pain. 
So I don't think it's difficult to define what we mean by consciousness. The challenge, the problem of consciousness is how consciousness fits into our scientific worldview. Despite great progress in our standard understand, uh, sorry, uh, great progress in our scientific understanding of the brain, we still don't really have even the beginnings of an explanation of how complicated electrochemical signaling is somehow able to give rise to an inner subjective world of colors and sounds and smells and tastes that each of us knows every second of waking life. So this is the profound challenge consciousness poses to the sciences. Now, it's, although it's broadly agreed that, that there is a profound challenge here, uh, one very common reaction is to say, okay, there's a problem, but we just need to plug away with our standards methods of investigating the brain, just do a little bit more neuroscience, maybe cognitive science, and we'll crack it. One thing I'm keen to press in my work as a philosopher of consciousness is, upon reflection, it turns out this is, isn't just another scientific problem. In many ways, this is, the problem of consciousness is absolutely unique among scientific problems. And in fact, that the standard tools of scientific investigation are not really equipped to deal with it, at least not entirely. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit more. Just have a little bit of water. Okay, so, so, so one way of pressing this is just to make the point that consciousness is not publicly observable. You can't look inside somebody's head and see their feelings and experiences. We know about consciousness not from observation and experiment, but from our immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. Um, now, now, science is used to dealing with unobservables. Fundamental particles like electrons and quarks, for example, can't be directly observed. But there's an important difference. Fundamental particles and other unobservable science postulates are postulated in order to explain what we can observe. Electrons and quarks are postulated as part of the, the standard model of particle physics, which is a, a theory that explains an incredible range of observable phenomena. In the unique case of consciousness, in contrast, the thing we are trying to explain is unobservable. And that is utterly unique among scientific problems. And it really constrains our capacity to deal with it experimentally. Okay, so, but that doesn't mean that we can't deal with it experimentally. We do have uh, a well-developed and robust experimental science of consciousness. So how do we do that? If, if consciousness is not observable, how do we, have a, how do we deal with it experimentally? Well, or, you, you can't observe someone's feelings and experiences, but fortunately, you can ask them, right? You can ask them what they're feeling and experiencing and rely on their testimony about their private, unobservable experiences. And if you do that while you're scanning their brain with an fMRI scanner or, a, or an EEG, you can correlate various kinds of brain activity with various kinds of conscious experience. We can discover that certain kinds of um, uh, brain activity always go along with, say, a feeling of hunger or an experience of red. And we can get more systematic about this. There are various proposals about what in general uh, is the correlation between brain activity and consciousness. And this is really crucial data. But it's not itself a complete theory of consciousness. And that's because what we ultimately want from a theory of consciousness is an explanation of those correlations. Why is it that a certain kind of brain activity comes along with an experience of red? Why is it that brain activity goes along with any kind of conscious experience? This is what we want explained. And because consciousness is unobservable, this is not a question we can just answer just doing more experiments. Uh, so the upshot is um, experimental work is important, but it leaves open multiple options. I think here it's a little bit like the situation in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is one of our most successful scientific theories. In terms of prediction, so much of our modern technology is based on it. Problem is, no one knows what the hell that theory is telling us about reality. And there are various interpretations, the many worlds interpretation, Copenhagen interpretation, um, Bohmian interpretation, and so on. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.